Hey everybody, welcome to episode 71 of the Ask Dap Show, where we answer your Volkswagen Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about the best Volkswagen model for making a ute, component locations for a TSI coolant temp sensor, and clutch pedal stops on Mark 7s. Mike via Facebook says, I'm looking into getting a Mark IV or a Mark V to make a Smith truck kit out of. What model with what engine would you suggest for the best results? Okay, so uh, for anybody who's not familiar with the Smith U-Truck, uh, there's a company who actually manufactures a conversion kit that gives you everything you need to do to convert a Mark IV or Mark V uh, Golf or Jetta into a Ute, which is a pickup you know, conversion, like an old El Camino or something of that nature. I'll uh, show you the two different versions of the Mark IV version and then the Mark V version of that Ute. It's a pretty cool setup. Um, you know, a fair amount of people have done them. And from what I understand, they're actually not super hard to do and don't require uh, really technical ability of welding and stuff like that. It is something that you could do at your house for, you know, assuming your technical skill was uh, within that range to do that. So which vehicle is the best one for that kit? Um, so this is kind of a tough question because I think this is gonna be a personal preference as to which one of those cars makes the most sense for an individual. My opinion would be, if you're looking for the best overall performing vehicle, I would say a Mark V, um, a Mark V two liter turbo car would be the best one. That would be for a couple reasons. Uh, that would mostly be because of power potential. Two liter turbo FSI engines with some basic bolt-on stuff will get you a pretty good amount of power. Uh, they also have independent rear suspension, which uh, all the Mark IV Platinum forms have solid rear axles or rear beam suspensions, which just in general handle worse. And uh, you know, independent rear car, which started in Mark V, is going to just overall handle better as a vehicle. Uh, you know, cost benefits can be tough because both of those cars are probably going to be Mark IV. No question is going to be cheaper. Um, and if you go down the road of Mark IV, you have a couple different options for engine. Two liter uh, non-turbo engine is going to be by far the most reliable and cost-effective version because they're super basic, they're cheap to fix and uh, plentiful out, uh, just there's lots of them around. If you go with that one, that's definitely the most economical choice. They are extremely boring and also extremely slow. Uh, so that's obviously something you have to deal with on that end. If you go down the road of 18Ts, uh, 18Ts are really probably the biggest, most tunable engine that Volkswagen had in that time. Uh, I put it in our my list that I made of top five VW Audi engines, which I'll link to um, here where you can check that out. But basically that was the intro into tuning for VW and Audi and really, really brought them to the scene was the 1.8T. Uh, one issue with 1.8Ts now that they've aged out pretty significantly, uh, 1.8Ts had a lot of vacuum lines and a lot of other piping and stuff in the engine bay. That stuff, because those cars are so aged, everything is brittle. Um, and has um, a lot of propensity for vacuum leaks in general. A lot of people delete it and stuff like that. Um, and then aside from that, obviously, most of those cars have been poorly maintained or a lot of them have been poorly maintained, leading to premature failure of a bunch of different things on the engine. Not, not maintaining a turbo engine well is just not good for them. Uh, VR6 is a great engine. Um, you know, power potential is not super big, but out of the box, you're getting a great engine that's pretty solid, but you are gonna have to probably deal with timing chains on a Mark IV VR6 um, based on the mileage that you're gonna find on most of them. Uh, so that would be kind of my rundown on them. And then Mark V, you have the 2.5 engine, which is overall a pretty solid engine, not super exciting, um, not great gas mileage, but pretty solid engine. Power is not huge, but definitely better than the Mark V 2 liter. So that could be an option as well. One thing Max mentioned, and I'd never really thought about this, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with those utes, but uh, because obviously when you convert those utes on a Jetta versus uh, a Golf, the rear actually ends up a lot shorter because obviously the rear end of a Jetta is longer than what you would find on a Golf. So uh, a lot of the Golf, uh, 
or GTI conversion ute trucks have a really stubby uh, bed. So, and he said they kind of tend to look funny. I'm not real familiar with that. That's just what uh, he mentioned that it's something food for thought when you're buying that car that seems like a Jetta might make the most sense um, on that platform. Dominic via shopdap.com says, on the 2009 Passat 2.0 TSI, where exactly is the coolant temp sensor located? I can only find info on the FSI location. Is it under or in the right side of the intake manifold? All right, so you have a TSI engine and you want to know where the coolant temp sensor is. Uh, coolant temp sensors on the TSI engine, two liter turbo TSI, which came from 2008 and a half uh, through most current 2014-ish and even still some current model 2015-2016 cars. Um, it is actually in the water pump or attaches right next to, attaches to the water pump itself. Um, and it is underneath the intake manifold. So that water pump would be on the front of the block towards the passenger side of the engine. Uh, it would probably be tough to see. Most techs I assume would probably replace it uh, blindly without actually taking anything apart. Uh, we have a video that we did with Charles, the home mechanic, our buddy, um, who it was an intake manifold DIY. I believe probably at one point, um, there was a shot where you can actually see where the water pump is when the manifold is actually coming off the car. If that's the case, I'll flash that where you can check that out uh, here where you're, you can see where the location of that is and we'll show you actually on a water pump that a brand new water pump where it actually comes with a new coolant temp sensor installed in it already. So I've been seeing some billet oil filter housings popping up all over the place. Other than the obvious durability over the plastic OEM unit, I see some of them touting decreased oil temps due to their thinned heatsink design. Are there truly any benefits to running one of these or is this something mainly for engine bay dress up? Brian, uh, I know you've purchased from us before uh, and just wanna say thank you. I appreciate the support very much. Uh, about your question about oil filter housings. So here's the general deal. Obviously we offer them because some suppliers we have uh, offer them, a lot of people have requested them, which is why we started offering them in the first place. Um, yes, I agree there's probably some durability benefits because aluminum is not going to become brittle and age like those plastic housings, which is why they generally tend to break and crack. Number one, people over torque them, that's pretty normal. Uh, but also number two, obviously plastic over time, all that heat cycling will eventually become brittle and then potentially crack. You know, obviously I'm sure there are people who have gone the full life of the vehicle, 150, 200,000 miles on a factory one. Um, but you know, it is something people like to upgrade because of that durability thing. Um, and it obviously also does look a little nice too to have that aluminum housing in the engine bay as opposed to the black plastic one. That's another reason why people do it. Heat sinks, uh, having the fins on there that dissipate heat. Um, couple things on that. I know there's mention of that being a thing. Uh, I personally have never tested that. Uh, it's really hard to test that because obviously you'd have to put it through the same conditions and do testing with oil temps one versus the other. Do I think it's plausible? Um, tough, air doesn't really run over that section a lot um, in general, just because it's behind the radiator and everything else. So in theory, yes, it gets some air, um, but that's not really where air is directed around the engine. Um, but by nature, aluminum is going to dissipate heat quicker than the composite material that is plastic. Um, I'm not an engineer, but that's just basic thermodynamics of, of those materials. Plastic um, and composite materials are not the same as aluminum. Aluminum dissipates heat very quickly. Um, so that fact alone means it's going to dissipate more heat than the composite one that comes in the vehicle in the first place. Is that going to see drop in oil temps? I don't know if that's factually accurate. I've never tested it. Again, we don't manufacture them, which is why we've never done testing like that. But in theory, you could argue that it's definitely feasible that it could drop oil temps just based on the fact that the aluminum itself does dissipate more heat than the composite material itself. So uh, frankly, the jury is out on that for me. I don't have any facts to back up that it actually has performance benefits of any kind. Um, but you know, for somebody who's on the edge of like, oh, I want to, uh, have them that's more durable and it looks nice, you know, the added benefit that it could have some, uh, heat dissipation in addition might make sense for you, depending on whether you feel like that's worth it for you. 
Paul, I installed a clutch stopper on my Mark 7 GTI. It helps eliminate the dead space when pressing the clutch pedal in and makes shifting smoother and quicker. I'm wondering if there's a chance that this could cause premature wear on the clutch. It doesn't engage right away when I let off the clutch pedal as I took some of the washers out because I wanted some safety room. It all seems well. I just wanted some advice from someone with more technical know-how. Thanks. All right, so uh, clutch stops. Uh, I've heard of these. We don't offer them. I'm not super familiar with them, but I understand the concept of it. Um, basically what this is, is a stopper or a uh, basically a shim or a plug that sits where at the base of where the clutch pedal uh, has a stop and actually extends it further out to give the total travel of the clutch pedal less travel. Um, could that wear your clutch? I don't see any reason how that could possibly wear the clutch unless it went to the point where it was not completely engaging the clutch and so it was always kind of dragging. My assumption is anybody who's done any significant testing on it, uh, people who manufacture it have made them so that that's not the case. I don't know if that's true or not. I make that assumption that if you're purchasing from somebody reputable, uh, that they have done that research to make sure, obviously, that they are going past the engagement point and actually at the uh, bottom of where the clutch pedal should be stopping uh, or in their minds should be stopping based on feel. Um, that's kind of my general consensus of it. I don't really have um, any direct experience, but I will say that if you like the way it feels, then I would say it's probably okay to continue. If you don't, then it's probably easily reversible and something you might wanna move away from. And that really is down to personal preference on how you feel like the clutch pedal feels after installing it. But again, as long as it's properly stopping at after it's completely, the clutch is completely disengaged, then you're never gonna run into a scenario where it's dragging. That would be my only concern with that is, is how the product is actually manufactured and the engineering that goes behind that to ensure that it's um, in, uh, at the proper stop point. Hey Paul, I have a 2006 Jetta 2.0T. I'm experiencing a crank but no start problem. Could the carbon buildup be causing this? Anthony, you have a no start condition on a Mark V with an FSI engine. Uh, I generally would say that no start conditions are almost certainly not to do with carbon buildup. Uh, there are some exceptions, uh, diesel cars, especially on older ALH cars, the, because if they had EGR, they would build up so much carbon in the intake, it would actually block the throttle body from moving, um, or, uh, EGR from actually allowing air into the engine. And it was so, so, so small that, uh, it would, you could barely even fit a pencil through the hole that all the air going to the engine would have. So that was a common thing on that, but on direct injection cars, it doesn't really build up like that. The carbon buildup is like gooey and sticky and it comes on the valves and it's kind of hard, but it doesn't come in like mass quantity like you would with EGR because the exhaust gas is coming back in and all that soot from diesels um, is circulating back in. So on that car, I would say it's almost certainly not going to be uh, related to, to a carbon buildup issue. Maybe it could contribute, um, but they're more commonly known for cold start misfires than actually a no start condition itself. Um, generally no start conditions are often either, uh, anytime you have a no start condition on a car, you have to check to see if you have air, spark, and fuel. Um, once you determine you have air coming into the engine through uh, the throttle body and everything else, then you can determine if you actually have spark uh, and then also fuel. Fuel might be the easiest for most people uh, because you can unplug the fuel pump in the back, the electrical fuel pump, you know, run a hose on it and see if it's actually pumping fuel. Uh, so I would say my best guess would be it's probably either related to the in-tank fuel pump or the fuel pump control module, but it, because of the FSI engines, obviously they have all the fuel issues around cam followers and high pressure fuel pumps. It could be related to that. So checking your cam follower is always a good thing as well, uh, along with that, although it's probably not that. Um, so most likely anything like that's going to be fuel related. So I would start with going down the road of checking the in-tank fuel pump and the fuel pump control module. Thank you so much for watching episode 71 of the Ask Dap Show, where we answer your Volkswagen Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.